Well, we had a family album, much like anybody's family album. It was a few old books and a, a series of brown envelopes stuffed with, with pictures. And they were seen in much the same way that they were in any family, I suppose. And sometimes we'd get them out and look at them, you know, we'd say, Mummy, Mummy, let's look at the pictures and, and see who everybody is, just like my child does now to me sometimes. But when I was 34, that family album came to have a completely different meaning for me. It would be wonderful. Life would be wonderful. I think they're really mystical. It's a moment in time that's kept forever. If you photograph something, you are what I call, you are freezing time. I have lots of pleasure when I take photographs. I see my photographs as almost like pieces to a jigsaw of life. It's looking, it's like looking for my identity in, a, in an everyday form. The emotions that they remind me of is of almost being like a puppet, of, of being forced into a certain image. I brought all my pictures when I was coming here what I'd accumulated over uh, a lifetime. When I arrived uh, at Southampton, the case wasn't there. Somebody that took this little suitcase, I don't know what they thought was in it, but all that was in it was uh, photographs, letters, some sand and rock from the Kaichur Falls and things like that, souvenirs. Uh, I was bringing with me a case full of it and I've lost all of that. I have no pictures of my mother or myself as a child and so on. My family's got a whole hidden history. <laughs> and when you look at other people's albums, you quite often think, oh, they looked like a happy family. They look like that. Why couldn't we have been like that? You know, and then you look at your own album and you think, well, we looked all right too. <laughs> so you realise, you begin to realise that everybody must have hidden stories. But when I was 34, that family album came to have a completely different meaning for me. My father died and I found out at that time that he'd had a long running affair from the time I was four years old until that date. I hadn't known anything about it. And it was, it was absolutely, absolutely shattering. It was, a, it was a terrible thing to find out, mainly because you realised it changed completely a whole lot of assumptions you'd made. So I then went back to that family album and started looking at the pictures in it and they had a completely different meaning because in it occurred photographs of him together with his mistress, pictures that I'd just looked at in the past and seen as 
a photograph of a family friend now had a different meaning. And I became, for a, for a time, obsessive about looking at those photographs as if I could get some sort of inner truth from them. There is no ultimate truth that you can only trust the surface of the photograph. And I'll know forever that behind that surface there can be all sorts of other interpretations. photography does well is to show surface detail. It doesn't show what lies behind that surface. It needs to be used with something else in order to be able to do that. Finding out that my father had had a mistress for a long time was, was one of the most shattering things that happened to me in my life. And it's changed the rest of my life. It's meant that forever afterwards, whatever situation I'm in, I'm always conscious that there might be one other piece of information, which if only I knew it, would completely change my view of that situation. And that's affected the whole of my life. Thirty years on, I've only got my memory to live with, that that is what I think my mother looked like. But uh, I can't be sure. Uh, Forty years is a long time to be dead. She wasn't there that I could send back and take a picture of her. Uh, and so losing those pictures was like losing her again. And uh, I cried a lot. The evidence is there in the photograph that I actually do belong to a family of black people. Quite often, my experience has been that I don't. That's the way, you know, the racism actually has actually affected my life. But when I see it, my mother's in that picture, my aunts are in that picture, I'm connected to those people. And it's real, it's true. And so it's, it's, it's quite clear to me that I am actually connected to something. And I suppose um, that's another reason why I went back at that time and decided to, to select those particular photographs because I think around that time it was becoming increasingly more important to me to really connect with that in me. Well, all kinds of things actually come into my head when I, when I look at it. I think about one of my aunts who's dead now and how close I was to her. Um, I think about... I think about the, the aunt on the, on the right who, you know, has just completely ostracised herself from the family, and I would really like to know her, you know, I really would like to know her, and what was go what's going on there for her. I think, I look at my my grandfather, and I think, what a man you were, you know, I, I wish you didn't die the year before I was born, you know, I would love to have known you. I think about my aunt, my other aunt, and I, I can almost see some of the sadness in her eyes, and the hard time that she had. I know she had a real struggle. I think about my mother, 
Well, there's so much there. <laughs> In fact, when I look at my mother, I can see me. I can see my mother, I can see me looking back at myself. Well, I, I, I mean, I was very scared as a kid a lot of the time, and uh, I didn't ever have an image of myself. I didn't ever have a picture of what that scared kid would look like, because the pictures I had of myself as a kid was always as a, a fairly self-confident kid, as a tomboy, as a tough kid, basically, as a kid who was sort of kind of sneering at the world and could cope, and that's how people described me. T but I know that I was terrified a lot of the time. I mean, I remember the day quite clearly. We were all going out for a picnic and stuff, and I was playing football. And uh, it, it really amuses me, because I think my mum is just looking at me, thinking, like, what, what on earth is this, basically? You know, what is this person that sprung from my loins? I look, I look at photos to try and, I don't know, glean things from the past about my relationship with my mum. And it's... I mean, I've noticed that the first thing I do when I go home is to look at photos of my mum and the past. I mean, partly because of an over, overriding curiosity about that period and not feeling strong enough to be able to ask her directly, so somehow this is, you know, like my way in. Tomorrow might be the day. We all have family albums of a sort, and what it seems the family album does is to tell the story from the adult's point of view, but particularly from a patriarchal point of view. And, I mean, the, I've looked at thousands of family albums and there doesn't seem to be much difference overall between the fact that they're saying to the family, look, we did the best we could for you as kids. And in a sense, it's telling the story in that way, all the highlights and the ideal parts, that uh, creates a whole set of gaps and absences that you can't fill the rest in. The main absence from the family album is power relationships, the power relationships that go on in the family itself that really nobody wants to talk about. Where are you going, my little one, little one? Where are you going, my baby, my own? Turn around and your ribbons, turn around and your lace. Turn around and you're a tomboy with a smile on your face. One little girl, one happy childhood, saved forever in picture. The reality of a happy family of strong, healthy children with good teeth, smiling and happy, all enclosed in one little network with the mummy and the daddy and the children, doesn't exist. It didn't exist for us. My father was a very violent man. He used violence towards us constantly. I lived my whole life in physical fear of my father. I could never refuse to be photographed in situations as a child. My father had total control. It's another one of those photographs where we are made to appear like a little happy family group. And in fact, you know, we'd, we'd done it wrong a number of times and had to be put back into position again and again and had to ride past at exactly the, the right moment. Part of taking those photographs was to establish a reality which didn't exist. I don't think it's possible to photograph fear. N certainly not the fear that I experienced in my childhood, because part of our way of surviving was to not let it show. There came a point when I was 16 years old when my father beat me very badly and for the first time, I knew that what he wanted was tears, and I refused to give those tears. So he, he couldn't stop beating me and kicking me. There are certain moments in my childhood that I cannot even bear to think about now. 
I mean, there are some occasions that I remember that I still cannot think too deeply about because not just my reactions to them at the time, but looking back at them as an adult, the implication of what was going on was so horrific that I can't, I, I still can't, I can't bear to think about it. My mind is skating around it, even as I'm talking about it. Because the emotions that they remind me of is of almost being like a puppet, of, of being forced into a certain image, a certain person, which I, I wasn't, I never have been. I think it's very healthy to remember the experiences and the emotions that you went through as a child. I think it explains to myself the sort of person that I am as an adult and the defences that I have against other people. I felt I had to be very strong as a child, very much in control of myself, very defensive, very protective of myself. And for me, those photographs remind me of why I had to be that strong, why I had to be that protective. I've always had a very idealised picture of my mum for a start, and I don't know whether she, you know, deliberately manufactured that for me or for herself, I don't know, but... I think that they're quite powerful, the images of my mum at an early age. They very much influenced the way I wanted to see myself. And it's almost like I see her as this Indian princess, somehow, and in a very romantic way. Yeah, it's very... It's, it's complicated, I think, the way... I use photography with my mum. Yeah, I've got this picture of me where I think I'm making this compromise between doing what I, my mother wants me to do and being myself. I sent her a copy of this picture to prove, yes, mum, I do wear the clothes that you send me in real life, sort of thing. Because she always gets me things that are much more feminine than I would normally wear, and uh, I sort of somehow deconstruct the femininity of it by wearing this sort of hefty leather jacket with it. It's, I mean, it's very odd to, to, to talk about something in a way, a, a photo, in such a serious way, but I think probably there are things about toughness and vulnerability and about being a, a butch little number as a kid and also being a girl and uh, sort of somehow having both of those accept, to be accepted by her. I don't think it's an overt message about being gay. It's nothing that I would have thought of in those terms, but I think there is that behind it. I hope that I'll be much more open with my own child than my parents were. I think it's quite possible to be very frank and possibly even franker than I am with children. I think they, I think they can deal with information, with facts about situations. They're more capable of dealing with it than we give them credit for. I think the things that are really upsetting in childhood often come from lack of knowledge and from fear. Sometimes it's, for some children, it's, it's a real fear. For other children, it's a, a fear of what might happen, things they don't know about.
reaction that I have to photographs of my father is resentment at how much I look like him. <laughs> I really, I mean, he's, he's a, a quite a good looking man in certain ways, but I, I see the hard line around the mouth and I know that I myself can produce that hard line and it frightens me how similar I am to him. And in fact, there are ways that I have of behaving that photographs of him evoke memories of the way he behaved and, and the way he behaved. And it makes me control my own behavior and think, I am not going to be like that. I am not going to react in that way, though I can feel it within me. And, and it's very obvious in photographs how similar we are. One of the photographs of my mother that I would really like to have is a photograph of her hands. Now, I think she would probably think that was very silly, but to me, my mother's hands are what bring back all the moments of comfort that she's given me in her life. They're, they're very similar to my own hands, except her fingers are slightly longer, and they're care-worn, work-worn. You can see the years that she spent with her hands in detergent and washing and cleaning for five children. But at the same time, they're very graceful. They're always cool. So when you feel them against your face, they're very comforting, especially if you're ill. And to me, they evoke a very strong emotional response. The crisis was that I was ill with breast cancer. And I was terrified that I was going to become like my mother who died of that illness. And I kept glim glimpsing myself in the mirror, actually looking like her and feeling awful about it, absolutely awful. And it's to do with ageing as well. So I went into psychotherapy for a while. And in the psychotherapy, I started to use existing photographs, one of which was a school photograph. I went to Rosie Martin, who's my phototherapist, and she helped me to recreate myself as the child in the photograph, which I can tell you was pretty traumatic. So the phototherapy was a kind of visual revisiting of my own history. It's like a kaleidoscope, really, of feelings and memories that go, that went through me, and out of it came these four images, which leads us into the next photograph, which is uh, me in the fantasy of the kind of school child I would have liked to have been, which was this little goody-goody school prefect who comes from a middle-class home and has got a bank manager for a father. From that, I then moved off into my family itself, and I became my mother, first of all. And at this point, I'm trying to be uh, this cheery woman that went on in spite of everything that happened to her. That's my overwhelming memory of my mother. And in a sense, the smile is a denial of her history. And then I, from that, I moved into the really trauma traumatic stuff, which was being my father. It's quite apparent that we're carrying around all this garbage in our heads. It's all a jumble. And you start to take it out, and it's like psychic waste. And then once you've got it out, you can actually start to recycle it and use it. I think we underestimate, actually, the power of our parents' ghosts. I carried inside myself very negative parents. And by becoming them on various occasions, and of course it's a projection, I was able to see what complicated histories they had. And I realised the more I went into my parents' history that, this, that phototherapy was not about parent blaming. I blame my parents for their class position, for instance, which is ludicrous. And in the phototherapy work, I've actually come to love my parents very much. I'm not haunted by parental ghosts anymore. They're now, they've been out there, they're now inside me, nice and warm. I've internalised them, and I can draw upon them as part of me all the time, which is what I do. And what, you know, that's what you should be doing with your history. You need to be able to draw upon it in that broader sense or that specific sense. Not either be unaware of it or pretend it isn't there, but learn to act in relation to your history in a positive way.